Ron Simancic, the Director of Marketing, Environment Test Solutions, and I'm pleased to be your host today. As a test engineer for many years with companies including Northrop Grumman, Westinghouse, and Daimler Chrysler, and I think you're going to find the material today both useful and informative. We'll start off with a look at the agenda. We'll have a brief introduction on Marvin Test Solutions. We'll take a look at relay fundamentals, see how that rolls into switch topologies, and of course, following into switch subsystems. And then we'll take a look at some implementation guidelines based upon some lessons learned. We're part of the Marvin Group. Marvin Engineering Company is the largest domestic aircraft armament equipment manufacturer. Things like equipment racks, missile rail launchers, those types of things. Land systems, on the other hand, focuses on environmental systems in power, auxiliary power units. And of course, Marvin Test Solutions is a test house. What do we mean by that? Well, if we take a look at, first of all, we're a vertically integrated test solutions company. And if you take a look at the images on the right hand of the screen, that, that, that essentially says a lot about um, that focus, whether, whether it's instrumentation or switch cards, subsystems, large systems like you see with the TS-323, or moving out to the flight line in organizational level maintenance with rugged solutions such as SmartCan and a number of our other solutions that are available. We, we really cover the gambit from a test standpoint. And of course, software, ATEZ is the most cyber secure test executive and development studio available. Now, we're, we're a customer-centric aerospace and manufacturing test company as well. And if you take a look at the top right-hand side of the screen, the fact that we're AS9100D really sets us aside because that's an aerospace quality standard that very few, few instrumentation companies can achieve. And we also focus on our customers' needs with the long haul in mind. We realize that many of our test systems are utilized in military and aerospace applications, and you don't have a three to five year life cycle. Many times it's 20 years or longer. So we really focus on reducing maintenance costs and, and containing sustainment costs as well. And we're a globally deployed solutions company. We, we have solutions across the world. So let's take a look at some relay fundamentals first, and then we'll roll that into the switching topologies. Electromechanical relays are probably the most common relays out there, and you see them on pretty much the, the majority of the switch cards. It's great for ideal, I mean, it's great for general purpose switching. A lot of different configurations are available out there, and we'll take a look at the configurations in a few. Um, you can do really high power uh, switching as well as switching in the microwave area, 50 gigahertz. Uh, 50, 60 gigahertz, for example, and you have really consistent contact resistance. And we're going to see with most of these implementations, there are definitely some disadvantages as well. Very low voltage switching could be an issue, as well as some thermal issues that come into play with electromechanical relays. Dry re relays, they're hermetically sealed, which means the contacts aren't exposed to the environmental conditions, depending on where you're at. It could just be oxidation, it could, it could be salt spray, you, you never really know. So it, it provides an additional level of protection there, and it also has very high isolation as a, as a result of that. But again, we have our disadvantages. And, and one is the magnetic fields generated. It can actually interfere with adjacent read relays, as well as other component trees. So you just need to be careful when you're looking at these. When we take a step to mercury wetted relays, it really gives us that consistent low contact resistance that we need for certain applications. And, and it's definitely higher power handling capabilities than a dry read relay as well, but they are more expensive. Uh, the, they're position sensitive as well. So depending on the application, if it's a tester that may be flight line based, for example, and you don't know where it's gonna end up or which orientation, could be a concern. And of course, because they're mercury wetted, that's a hazardous material and down the road disposal could also be a concern. Now solid state, clearly the quickest. Very fast switching times, they're small. You can also have these in a number of configurations. And because you have no mechanical parts, you have great mean time between failures. You don't have any uh, mechanisms that are going to uh, a lock in place and or weld, for example, that you might have with a mechanical relay. But again, we do have our disadvantages. Because of the type of switching involved, it can de degrade signal integrity, so you don't really see these widespread 
in functional test applications, but there are applications, there are times when it, it may make sense. Um, it, it's not really good for high voltage swings. And you also have leakage currents, leakage current with solid state relays. So when we look at relay specifications, and we're going to reference it to a particular switch card in this case, there are certain fundamental specifications that we really need to be aware of and compare against our test requirements documents to ensure that we're going to be able to perform the testing required. So relay life is based on a couple things. One is it's spec generally with load and without load. And you can see in this particular case, it shows at low level, you have very high life expectancy. But as you start to put load on these mechanical relays, you can reduce and will reduce the life expectancy. So that's one of the things you need to be concerned with. Current, both switching and current carry capabilities are, are definitely very significant specifications that you need to keep your eye on when you're specifying your, your switch cards and switch subsystems. Switchable current is going to be less than your contact carry current because as the two contacts on your relay come closer and closer together, you're going to get to a point where you're going to have some arcing occurring. And if you have very high current potential across those relays, the arcing could potentially weld the relay shut as well as you, you, you're going to have some molten characteristics to that contact material anyhow when you have high current flowing through it. But that switching and current carrying are, are definitely two distinct different applications areas that you need to be concerned with. So if you have a higher current capability, for example, that's coming close to that current carry, you want to make sure that you're not doing your hot switching with that high amperage applied to the contacts. Switching voltage is another common specification, and that's pretty straightforward. You can see in this case, you have your maximum switching voltage, for example, is 220 volts DC. But there is also, for certain switch cards, cold switching voltage and standoff voltage, which is similar to the hot and cold that we saw with the current. So the standoff voltage could potentially be greater than what that switching voltage is. And then the, the minimum relay drive voltage needs to be adhered to as well. Many of the switch, if you're buying a switch card or a switch subsystem, the manufacturer is going to be addressing that hopefully in, in the correct fashion. But the reason it could be a concern is if you don't have a, a sufficient drive voltage, you can get what's referred to as chattering. And essentially that means that relays opening and closing very, very fast. And you could just imagine if you were doing hot switching, for example, and you had a couple amps and then you start chattering that relay back and forth, I, I can guarantee you're gonna damage the relay, you're gonna have welding, you're pro uh, potentially welding the contacts together and, and you're definitely gonna damage the performance of the relay. So really that that's something of, Again, it's going to be addressed for you in many applications, but it's something to keep your mind, your eye on as well. The overall power rating is another one that's a little bit tricky if you just take a glance at the specifications. So it's like, okay, great, I can switch 220 volts DC, two amps, excellent. Well, what kind of power is that going to result in? Just those two together, you can see from the map that it's 660 watts, but what's my switching power rating? for a channel, it's 60 watts. So clearly we need to make sure we're not exceeding this overall switching power rating when we're considering the voltage and current that we're applying to the system. And the example down below shows that if we do need to um, switch 220 volts and it's a 60 watt requirement with the card, how much current can I put through that relay with 220 volts applied. And you can see it comes out to 270 milliamps, which is significantly less than my overall switching current specified. So again, keep in mind your current voltage and very important, the power on a per channel basis. Now, some of the operational considerations when it comes to operate and release uh, are tricky as well. And, and those of you who have been doing this for a while understand what I'm talking about because when we have this debounce, if I, if I close a relay and immediately apply my source and take some measurement, some type of measurement, 
I run the risk of having inaccurate measurements because of contact bouncing that occurs. And when we look at the operate time, the operate time for many manufacturers takes into account this contact bouncing. So essentially we need a little bit of settling time before we actually do our tests and measurements. And, and that's something to keep in mind as we're doing our sequencing in our, in our test software. And now we're going to take a look in a couple of minutes a little deeper about relay configuration. But on the top red highlight, you can see that this particular card is 25 single pole double throw form C. And if you're not really familiar with these or it's been a while since you looked at these, we have a really good review coming up as to exactly what this terminology is referring to. And then we need to ensure that we're not confusing the, the relay specs versus the switch card specification. I know in most functional test applications, we're not actually looking at that individual relay unless there is some type of performance characteristics we really need to delve into. But we need to ensure that we focus on the switch card specifications because they take a lot of additional information into account, such as when you're laying out the PCB, we have certain requirements from the standpoint of tracing, you know, the width, the spacing, what, where the various ground planes are, a, a lot of different um, act or, or a lot of different features and aspects of the design layout for the PCB for the overall switching subsystem to function properly. And of course, we need to be concerned about both card and system parasitic capacitance. And we'll, we'll take a look at a little bit more about that later on, but it can result in high inrush current. And depending on the measurements we're taking, if they're very sensitive measurements, it can also result in inaccurate measurements if we're not careful in, in how we address that. So as we think about a relay versus card and what's my additional, my ideal switch card going to be doing for me. If, and this may seem really obvious, but you must keep in mind that ideal is not real world, right? So if we have an off state, so we have an open state, ideally open circuit, zero capacitance, zero voltage drop, infinite in resistance. And, and that's what we're shooting for. On a closed state, we want a short circuit. We want zero resistance. We all know we're always going to have some contact resistance. We want a zero voltage drop. If we have contact resistance, guess what? We get a little bit of voltage drop that we need to be concerned with. And of course, we want leakage, zero leakage current as well in this ideal scenario. So let's take these fundamentals we just discussed and move them in to switching topologies. We, we took a brief look at one of the specifications that was single pole double throw form C. Well, here's a, a real quick schematic representation. And, and again, this is probably a review for everyone on the call, but, but we'll move past this quickly. But relays are referred to in, in the many times you're switching cards by poles and throws, the number of common terminals and the number of positions that can create connection. So as we go down the schematic on the right, you can see we have a single pole, single throw, double throw, double pole, single throw, and double pole, double throw for representation, just so you get a feel on the, the pole versus throw terminology. Very common. If, if you're not really familiar with this, you may want to come back and take a look at it because it's the, the way switching is addressed uni universally in the test, and, test environments. So the type of forms that we referred to before, we had single pole double throw form C. Well, the very common terminology is typically form A and form C. We see that all the time. Form A being that single pole, which is normally open. And you can see a, a little schematic representation of that. Form B is the same thing as A, except it's normally closed. And then, of course, form C is just that standard single pole double throw relay. Now, for Virtually every test system, with the exception of maybe you're, stand, you're sitting there with a DMM and a power supply and a unit under the test and you're just probing manually, switching is the heart of my functional test system, without a question. Whether it's multiple test points, multiple instruments, combination of both or multiple UUTs, 
and the types of switching topologies we use in these different instances is going to vary. And it may be a situation, and we'll take a look at this in a little bit, where we actually have a hybrid switching approach. So for the middle one, multiple instruments, for example, that's going to be a great application for matrix. And it also might include our multiplexers as well. But we're going to take a look at when that makes sense and, and some of the design considerations that, that are involved with both of those. So the four main types of topologies we run into is just general purpose switching. And that's what we saw with the first example of the switch cards when we were looking at the specifications. We have multiplexers, single input to many outputs or vice versa, matrix, many inputs to many outputs, and then the hybrid actually combines a little bit of everything. It may have matrices, multiplexers, it could potentially be on a single card, or it could be the combination of these in a switching subsystem. So these are the four main building blocks we'll be referring to moving forward. So the, the general purpose relay or switch card is, is just a discrete implementation, a discrete switch architecture. And in this case, we, we go back to the example we looked at before for the specs, 25 single pole double throws. Now, if you wanted to, could you make a multiplexer or you, could you make some other configuration out of a general purpose switch? Well, certainly you could, but in the case, let, let's just say a multiplexer. If we wanted to make a one by eight multiplexer, you would actually have to make your connections external to the switch card. So you're going to have lots of wiring going back and forth to the input of the switch card. And that's not only going to create issues with reducing your bandwidth, um, maintainability, but, but this extensive wiring is definitely going to impact, um, impact the overall performance. So when we then move into our multiplexers, the multiplexer focuses on, ship, on switching a single input to multiple outputs. And we can see in this particular example here, we have multiple sources going to the UUTs, and then we have multiple measurement instruments that are connected to that EUT as well. So it really simplifies and reduces the need for either a, a lot of instrumentation potentially, because for example, you can multiplex many signals into your DMM, many different signals from the UT into the DMM, for example. And the same goes for other uh, types as well. And there are times when this can be used not just in data or, or in functional tests, but for data acquisition for scanning, for example, if we're scanning temperature with a scanning DMM, it's gonna go through a multiplexer card. Now, what about the matrix? The matrix is a really, really great card because you have ultimate in flexibility. So you can see in the diagram on the right, you can essentially connect any source to any UUT point, as well as sources to each other and UUT uh, pins to each other, which is great from the standpoint of overall flexibility, but there are some issues we need to be concerned with from the standpoint of safety, as, as well as bandwidth. And from the standpoint of the schematic you see on the right, depending on what relays we close, we could really have some significant stub effects, and we'll see what the stubbing means, but essentially that's a, that's a transmission line that's there to, to pick up noise and degrade the measurement that we're seeing in our switch systems. So this shows in more detail what I'm referring to from the standpoint of that cross-point matrix, just a standard cross-point matrix, and the stubbing effects. If I want to connect point Y1 to X1, piece of cake. I close my one relay and I open three additional relays on the Y1, X2, X3, and X4 path. But what does that give me on that on the top row? Essentially, I have my, my signal path of choice, which is X1, Y1, but I have this large stub hanging off that. And again, it's, it's a transmission line, so it's an antenna. So it's going to pick up noise. It's going to pick up other types of interference, and that will impact your bandwidth and your measurement performance. And something else just real quick from the standpoint of safety that I mentioned on the previous slide, you can imagine if you we have the flexibility to connect X1 to X3. If both those are power sources and we're not careful, 
we could potentially short things together, damaging our sources, damaging the switch card, potentially damaging the unit under test. So there, there are some intricacies that we need to be concerned with when we're dealing with a full cross point matrix. This is an example of how we address some of those issues with stubs. It's called being able to develop in a stubless matrix, essentially. And you can see if you could compare the schematic on the, the center bottom versus the one on the right, significantly more relays in play to provide a stubless matrix. But you're going to see significant improvements in bandwidth, as well as you're going to have the, the ability to utilize this in higher bandwidth applications. But you need to keep in mind that because of all the variable paths and the way we isolate, you could have different path-to-path -path and certain insertion losses if this is an issue with you. So what about trees? Again, we take a look at that base matrix configuration up top where we had our stubs giving us concerns in degrading the performance of the switch card. Well, in the case of a uh, tree matrix that we see below, clearly we don't have issues from the standpoint of the stubs because the way this is designed, I can only switch X1, for example, to Y1. I have no additional stubs hanging out there because we've isolated those two points. However, with the tree matrix, we lose some of that switching flexibility. I can't switch X1 to X3, for example, or Y4 to Y2. Now, we're going to see there are times when this is definitely a preferred solution because oftentimes people will, or test engineers are in the situation where I have X resources, X places, um, measurement devices, my UT has additional measurement points. So I may think, oh, I, I might need a 16 by 16 matrix because of all these various points I need to address. But as we look at the test requirements document, it's probably going to become clear that very seldom, if ever, do I really need to have the flexibility to connect all those ins to all those outs simultaneously. And being able to use a tree matrix simplifies programming, and it also gives us that signal path um, uh, that single path switching and, and provides uh, additional uh, performance improvements from the standpoint of repeatable insertion losses as well. Now, let's move into switching subsystems. We looked at the relays, we looked at the switching topologies. Now, how do we put that into a switching subsystem that's going to address so many of the different types of signals in tests that we're um, faced with performing. So a hybrid switching matrix combines the topologies that we reviewed, and we talked about that for, for a moment earlier. So we have our general purpose, our multiplexers, and our matrices. And depending on what we're trying to achieve, we, we, we connect these and, and address it differently. And for it to have the highest performance, oftentimes these are all integrated into a single card. Now, hybrid pin switching subsystems also have the objective many times of providing any resource to any pin and that's a key approach that needs to be taken into account especially for very large test systems because it is ideal when we need to combine analog and digital testing into a single system and overall it's going to give us much higher bandwidth than if we had these various pieces connected externally via cabling so let's take a look at an implementation challenge. And this is just one that, that we run into and we actually have customers doing this level where we have a lot of resources and a lot of test points to address. So in this particular case, you got 128 resources, 4,500 test points. If initially it's like, oh, I need to connect all these at the same time, I'm just gonna do a matrix. Well, take a look at that relay count. Just for um, basic relays with a basic matrix that has issues with stubbing, you're pushing 600,000 relays. And if you're gonna do de-stubbing implementation, it's 650,000 relays. So a, a lot of relays, you're gonna need a storage room to fit this test system because it's gonna be a large footprint. You're gonna have poor mean time between failure just because you have so many relays you need to address 
And ultimately, it's not going to be a viable solution. But there are other ways to approach this. And this is really incorporating that hybrid approach. So one of the examples we're going to look at is, you know, is uh, the Genesis subsystem, which is our flagship hybrid switching subsystem. And in this case, we're going to take those 128 resources and we're going to connect those using a uh, 128 by 16 matrix. And with that 128 by 16 matrix, we're going to be able to put the stubbing circuitry on that front end piece of it, which is going to reduce, the, it's going to give us a high bandwidth performance, but it's also going to reduce issues um, from the standpoint of total relay counts. Now, if we take it a step further and look at the overall number of relays in this type of implementation. So we have that analog bus with our destubbing circuitry, and then we just plug in the required switch cards to give us the ability to address the very high test point number. And in this particular example, which is going to be 128 to 4,500, we're looking at less than 15,000 relays compared to 650,000. Huge difference. We're going to have the high reliability. We're going to have uh, better bandwidth, and, and it's the high densities are also going to allow us to provide this solution in a compact PXI 6U form factor versus having to have a space the size of a garage to fit the other matrix. So we need to be able to address different types of signals in this hybrid switching subsystem. And the way we do that is by splitting it out based upon low bandwidth, high bandwidth, RF requirements going up to the 500 meg region, as well as very high speed digital with uh, high vector rates. And you can see a basic block diagram on the right hand side that addresses this. But this diagram shows us in a little more detail how this really plays together. So we have 128 resources we need to bring in. How do we do that? Well, we discussed the 32 by 16 matrix, and you can see here that's designated as, as our RTM, but that 32 by 16 can be expanded. So we expand that in 32 channel chunks. So we can go 16 by, I'm sorry, 64 by 16 all the way up to my 128 by 16. That provides that signal on the back plane. And then from there, we can plug in what we refer to as our multi-matrix cards, and clever way of saying combining multiplexers and matrices on a single switch card. And I, and I won't step through and read off the various configurations because we have a number of those, but it really gives the ultimate flexibility from the standpoint of being able to look at my test requirements document, say, all right, I have these resources coming in. I can split it out by low frequency, high frequency. Do I have RF components? What about my digital switching? And then what segment of that really needs to go out to my mass interconnect to interface with the unit under test or units under test, depending on um, the, the type of application we're addressing. And this is a, another example of that. And it just gives us some more detail as far as that there are times when I may need to do really high speed digital testing. And in that case, I can have direct digital inputs to the ITA. We can see that we have that 16 wire bus where all my high frequency resources come in. Uh, and, and we can have dedicated high frequency inputs as well as my ability to bring in those low frequency in analog instruments through that 32 by 16 matrix that can, of course, be expanded. Now, as we look at all these various connections we're making, again, let, let's just use the 4,500, but you can say 1,000 uh, points on my interface test adapter, not out of the question. Well, if we had the ability to eliminate the wiring from the test card up to the ITA, and again, back to the instrumentation and so forth, it's going to greatly improve reliability and maintainability of the system. And that's indeed what Genesis does. You can see the image on the left-hand side. It's, it's a circuit card that interfaces to your interface adapter, interface test adapter. In this case, it's Mac panel, SCOW connectors, and that is all on one PCB 
that then plugs into the 6U PXI chassis. So you've eliminated all cabling. And just think about that for a minute. If we had 4,000 points going up to the ITA, you'd probably cut out. But besides reliability and maintainability, if the test that probably weighs 200 pounds less than it would have. So really, the, this is a really innovative approach to address these high channel count applications to improve the overall performance. And by the way, it's going to improve bandwidth as well because you don't have all these wires just hanging out there in, in hopes that everything has been addressed properly from the standpoint of shielding and so forth. We need to think about software as well in the software tools when we're dealing with very large systems like this, especially when it comes to a matrix. Because as we said, your, your person writing your, inter, your test programs may not be the same engineer that designed the test system. So ensuring that we don't damage resources in the test system really is sort of paramount depending on uh, the application. So a software tool, it really needs to be in play. In this case, the tool that we provide is, it, it goes in line with our integrated test development environment, but it's called Switch Easy. And what it does, it provides safeguards and protections so we don't short sources together and, and we don't damage our UUT, but it also gives us the ability to do end-to-end -end signal routing very easily and deterministically ensuring that we get that same performance from test to test from UUT to UUT. And another thing that we need to address from the standpoint of our test system is, is the lifespan and the overall performance. So having the ability to track relay closures and understand the, the predictive maintenance aspect of this can be really key from the standpoint of test set uptime. So if I know under heavy load, my particular switch card, for example, has 100,000 closures, then what I can do is be looking at this non-ball on a regular basis saying, okay, I've cycled 50,000 signals to it, 70,000 signals to it. And what I can do is look at that and really address the predictive aspect and say, okay, it's time to switch out and put in a new switch card. Now let's look real quickly at the implementation guidelines. I'm a few minutes over, so I apologize, but we'll go through this quickly. And this is a review of the various aspects. We, we know we have the basic architectures to deal with, whether it's a multi-rix matrix, and really the hybrid switch system is, is really the ultimate in performance for very high channel count applications. We need to ensure that we're adhering to specifications from the standpoint of hot and cold switching if we want to maximize the life of our relay and our switch cards. We need to ensure that the typical uh, that our switching power isn't being exceeded by looking at the voltage and current only and not taking a look at the channel power requirements. And then from the standpoint of accuracy and being able to, especially with low-level measurements, we need to ensure that we're providing enough settling time before we actually go out and make our test measurements. Bandwidth is a real consideration for matrices, especially if we're using implementations that don't address stubs. And of course, we get the best system level performance many times with a hybrid test systems. Parasitic capacitance impact. We, we looked at what could happen from an inrush standpoint for our switch card, but also when we have long interface cables going from different instrumentation to the UUT through our switching system, we can have situations where we have that parasitic capacitance built up on the line. So if I do a measurement with my DMM and I don't allow adequate time for the parasitic capacitance to bleed off, I'm going to get inaccurate measurements. And that's where many switch cards have discharge relays. I could take a measurement, pull in the discharge relay, bleed off the parasitic capacitance, and then take another test. ITA cabling, we looked at that, very key. Wired versus wireless from the standpoint of maintenance, uh, reliability, overall performance, really key. And then having the proper software solution that not only provides safeguards, but also simplifies my programming. For additional information, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. We, we have an engineering staff. We're, we're a company of test engineers for test engineers. We'll be happy to take a look at the issues and problems you're dealing with and make recommendations. 
from the standpoint of software. We, we have the most cyber secure development environment available in ATEZ, the integrated development environment and test executive. So if you're thinking about um, the, the proper test software solution, feel free to give us a call about it, that as well. And, we, and you can reach out to Jim or Victor, depending on, on your location, whether it's U, US or, or Europe, Europe. And our magic online support help can also be used even if you're just considering things or if you have questions about different things and you don't necessarily want to call us and get, give us a shot, feel free to go on Magic Online and we can address your concerns that way. So I would like to thank you for attending, first of all, today. This is the second session with our ATE primer, and we'll have additional sessions rolling out over the next couple of months, so you keep your, keep your eyes open for that. But we'd like to West, wish both to you, yourselves, your family, and your company, that the best, please stay safe, stay healthy in these challenging times. Thank you again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you in our next session. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks.